Welcome back to This Week in Global Health. This is Season 2. I know a lot of you have been watching Season 1 and you've been waiting over the summer and you've been asking the question, when will they be back? Well, we're back. We're back and we're ready for another exciting, fun, interesting and educational season of This Week in Global Health. This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG, is a weekly live Global Health News Roundup. We've got a panel of uh, enthusiastic... I nearly said... Uh, let me not say what I nearly said. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a panel of enthusiastic and knowledgeable uh, panel members that are going to tell you all sorts of interesting things today. We're going to start off with two news items, and we're going to be talking this week about antibiotic resistance and refugee health. Uh, Brian, would you jump right in with our news items for this week? Absolutely. So we're highlighting a couple uh, key items from uh, Friday's issue of uh, Global Health Now. And uh, the first one is uh, on antibiotic resistance. And I thought this was particularly interesting. This is a report from the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics, and Policy. And they have some published some alarm, alarming data on uh, bacteria resistance uh, to last resort antibiotics. <laughs> Uh, that can lead to life-threatening infections around the world. Now, what's noteworthy here uh, for me was that this was uh, the study incorporates uh, all available data uh, from low- and middle-income countries as well. Uh, previously, to me, uh, a lot of the data has been, you know, based in wealthy countries, and we've seen a lot of news stories out of the U.S. and U.K. and elsewhere. Um, but the antibiotic resistance is a serious issue uh, in low- and middle-income countries as well. So, for example, in India, 57% of uh, the infections caused by the hospital superbug Klebsiella pneumonia is a uh, it's a dangerous uh, superbug found in hospitals was found to be resistant to uh, one type of last resort dr drug last year so this is a uh, really worrisome that this is uh, definitely a global phenomenon I think possibly in the past the lack of available data has made this um, uh, as sort of trained our focus on uh, wealthier countries, but certainly it's definitely uh, an issue around the world too. And uh, I like the quote from the director of the center who said, you know, it's like climate change that uh, we're all at risk. Definitely. That's a really interesting uh, report, uh, Brian. And actually, I was going through, so the Center of Disease Dynamics, Economic and Policy, uh, CDDEP, have recently re released this report which talks about antibiotic resistance. And what really amazed me was the fact that, you know, how often we think that abuse in the clinical setting in terms of, you know, um, patients given antibiotics or, you know, abusing, taking antibiotics when they're not prescribed by doctors is a big issue. But what we don't realize is that a majority of antibiotic abuse happens in the animal husbandry or livestock. Uh, in fact, 80% of antibiotics use, usage in United States is actually in livestock. So that's a really major area where we don't often look at. Definitely a, a serious concern there and that imbalance between the, the life-saving antibiotics for uh, medicine versus the antibiotics that are used in uh, animal feed uh, shows a, a, an incredible imbalance there in priorities, if you ask me. You know, when I think about antibiotic resistance, you know, I often think, you know, human beings have evolved to be good at, very good at certain things. We can climb walls, build walls, we can make bridges, we can even go to the moon. Microbes have evolved over four and a half billion years to be incredibly good at adapting to a microchemical environment. That's, that is what they're good at. They're good at that in the, way, in the same way that we're good at getting to the moon and doing all these other kind of things. That's their core competency is being able to adapt very quickly to a changing in a microchemical environment. And so when we fight them by changing their microchemical environment, we're actually playing on their field. We're, we're challenging them with the kind of challenge that they've proven themselves very good at, at managing. And so, uh, you know, antibiotic resistance, and we've seen it with TB, we're seeing this emerging uh, uh, drug-resistant TB problem and, and others. So anyway, let me not waffle on. Uh, Sulzan, you had another comment. Definitely. Um, so I wanted to say it's really interesting, like, you know, that when we say that antibiotics are being used in livestock, it's very important to note that that is not to just prevent uh, animals or cattle from getting diseases. It's actually being used as a growth factor, and that's what the saddest thing. Uh, you know, they're using to fatten up the cattle or fatten up the chickens and at, uh, at an amount which actually may encourage uh, antibiotic resistance because it's really low. So microbes can uh, really adapt pretty well to it. 
And um, in fact, I know Terry just sent me a message saying that I want to be a microbe, but kind of sense about that. Yeah, antibiotic resistance is really a big problem right now, especially if we're making it really easy for microbes. Okay, Jessica, we cannot hear you. I don't know if you're on mute, but I can see you're trying to talk and uh, your lips are moving. Maybe it's just me that can't hear you. Anybody else can hear Jessica? Nope. Oh, no. no. Nope. All right. Uh, but honestly, very quickly, Greg, can I mention that in 2010, 63,200 tons of antibiotics was consumed worldwide by just livestock alone. It's much more than human consumption. So okay. Thanks very much, Susan. Right. Now, what I'm going to suggest is, um, Brian, why don't you jump into your second story? Jessica, we're going to get your sound up and running because we need you. <laughs> we can't cope without Jessica. And her mute, she sent a message saying her mute is weird. I will come back. So she'll be back. No, but fear not. Jessica's coming back. Brian, jump in with your second news story there. Sure. Our second story uh, is from uh, Germany, where German health officials are gearing up for their uh, preventive measures to assist the uh, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees and refugees from other countries who, uh, as everybody knows, is are, are flowing into Europe. Um, so, and uh, you know, I think there's a, a few interesting things here. One is, of course, uh, people are coming from these uh, uh, states where incredible conflict is going on, so they've got this uh, sort of medical histories that are shaped by the, this conflict, uh, lack of access and deprivation, um, and then, of course, a difficult journey where, you know, it's of weeks or months uh, of, you know, hygiene, poor hygiene, overcrowding, and, uh, and stress. Now, that's, you know, that's sort of a given, but what's interesting to me is that there's, like, actually no direct correlation between uh, the spread of disease and movements of refugees. Uh, everybody would kind of think about that sort of as a, as a given, but actually, you know, from what I've been reading in this story, study and elsewhere is that there, there hasn't been um, uh, sort of that kind of a direct correlation. So Germany has reported a few outbreaks of uh, measles and chicken, chicken pox, but those are sort of normal uh, kind of everyday routine things there in, in Germany as well too. So of course, uh, WHO is urging preventive measures um, such as vaccination upon arrival and adequate health care as soon as possible. And interestingly, uh, in Germany, which has 16 states, uh, all the states have sort of different regulations regarding this uh, in, in terms of dictating different screening exams and uh, requirements. Um, so I think that that's a, you know, it's, it's kind of another issue involved too. Um, but it, it's not sort of, I think some people may be attempting to, you know, paint this as like sort of a, a, a huge sort of global threat, but the, the movement of refugees like this. But um, from what I'm reading, it's, it's not the same, not that big of an issue yet. So Brian, first of all, great topic to bring up for us. Thank you. Sure. And so and when we look at this issue, um, we have a responsibility as a global community to be responding. So let me just offer some uh, additional perspectives for our panel. Number one, Germany, as you described, actually has no national, meaning countrywide, policy on immunizations. Uh, but their record shows they're about 90%. They're high. But now when we look at these refugees coming in, we see these refugees coming in, they're about 70% for the major vaccines or immunizations that we look for. And so there's that spread that we need to be conscious of. Um, I have heard the same reports on what the incidence is of refugee outbreaks. Um, and I've heard it uh, coming from other countries uh, in addition to the reports you've mentioned with Germany. So exciting topic for you to share with us. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Definitely, very, very true, uh, Terry. And now that you mention, uh, I don't know if some of our viewers saw our uh, show on measles uh, a couple of uh, months ago, but Germany was the site of a huge measles outbreak last year, despite having uh, measles vaccine coverage, which was really high. And it's really interesting how we're talking about, you know, um, how infectious diseases uh, in Germany is going to be impacted. And we talk about measles and vaccination. What is not very often talked about is the mental disorders and the chronic diseases. Um, example, UN High Commissioner for Refugees did a study in 2013, and they found that Syrians which are arriving at camps uh, outside uh, of Syria, refugee camps, 
had high rates of diabetes and high blood pressure, which is also going to have a significant impact on the health system in Germany. Um, the same study also found out that 21.6% of Syrians in a refugee camp in Jordan were suffering from anxiety, while about 9% had post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are the two areas which are often you know, ignored or not talked about when you talk about refugees, uh, refugees coming in. But that's, uh, again, a really important part uh, to take care of when, when we talk about health systems. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me now? Oh. We can, Jessica. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jessica, okay. you're back just in time, actually, because <laughs> unless anybody had any other comments about refugees, I was about to say Jessica is our, our science guru for the day. She's going to do a science update, but she's going to do the entire thing with sign language because her mic's not working. <laughs> so for anybody listening to this as the audio podcast, you guys are going to be left out completely. But, uh, Greg, I've anyway, got, I've got one, one quick... Greg, I've got one quick note on uh, on the refugee topic. Uh, just want to alert everybody that tomorrow, uh, Monday, September 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is hosting a symposium on uh, the refugee crisis, uh, and it will be including uh, Assistant Secretary of State Ann C. Richard, um, who will be uh, talking as well. And this will be webcast at jhsph.edu slash refugee hyphen symposium. Okay, and if you send me that link, uh, Brian, I'll stick it into the show notes. Yep, we'll and, do, we'll and, do. and Brian, if you send me a lunch invitation, I'll be there. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Worth flying in for. Okay, over to Jessica. Jessica, talk to us. Awesome. Okay, so I, since I was muted, oddly muted, God knows why, but it um, doesn't matter now. I will address. I wanted to address a comment that Solzin um, was talking about with the antibiotics um, and the problems with in terms of the agriculture, especially uh, in cattle and other animals and whatnot. So that's I'm going to. That's the paper that I'm going to be talking about. There's re some research done on it, but I also wanted to talk about what Terry had said uh, in terms of, or no, sorry, that was you, Greg, talking about the ways that microbes can evolve because there actually was a paper that came out recently that showed where that a new drug um, that's like still being developed, they tested it on some antibiotic and it basically took out a protein that the, the uh, bacteria really needed to do and then the bacteria did this kind of unexpected thing where it just switched on these unknown genes. So talk about you know bacteria being incredibly adaptable, well here's just another example of something we didn't know about them. But the main thing I wanted to talk about was a study that was uh, just you know, came out in the summer in Journal of Dairy Science and people have been worried about what is the antibiotic resistance that is in um, in cattle, especially if that people are using it to keep them um, healthy and whatnot. And so what they did was they did a lot of swabs from milk um, and uh, I guess also from cattle that had infections of the udder. Um, and then, but they also did took nasal swabs from people that work with the cattle. And what they found actually was that antibiotic resistance was less in the cattle. There was uh, over 25% of um, the isolates that they pulled from the, the cattle were resistant to just one drug class of antibiotics. However, humans, the, the swaps from humans, um, over 40% of the, the samples they took from them were antibiotic resistant and it was multi-drug uh, resistant, so not just one. So it, it's kind of surprising that in the animal there was less antibiotic resistance. So the fear, though, is that you know the animals aren't showing as much antibiotic resistance, but humans could pass it on. Right, and um, this this actually speaks to what we often talk about. You know, you guys have introduced me to this idea of one health, uh, and we're going to have to do a show on that sometime. Mm -hmm. I need to learn about it. It sounds very interesting. But this idea that everything is connected, and you know, we our our health as human beings is not in isolation, but we actually live in a much more complicated ecosystem. Um, excellent. That's uh, very interesting. Thanks very much, Jessica. And uh, the paper that you're referring to, is that an open access paper that we can put the link to in our show notes? It is not, but I can, there's been, there's like a press release on it that basically kind of lays up in study and actually gives you more the lay, the lay term. Okay, so Jessica has frozen. You've frozen, Jessica. 
or maybe you're unfrozen now, but I think you got what you were saying. Basically, so you're going to send us a link, and that'll take you take us to a press release that gives us the lowdown about that paper, um, and maybe the details of the paper, and people that maybe have a subscription can go and find it, or if they work for a, or work or study at a university that has a subscription, they can find it. We're going to move right on, and our last item for today is Sulzan is going to tell you about a job opportunity. So if you're out there in the job market, stay tuned. This is very important. Go Sulzan. Thank you, Greg. Um, so since we talked about refugee health, I actually have an internship opportunity from the American Refugee Committee, which is an international nonprofit, non-sectarian organization that has provided humanitarian assistance for the last 35 years. And they work in 11 different countries, uh, a number of them in Africa, Liberia, and Sudan, uh, two of them. So they're looking for volunteers who would be available for four months to six months um, to work. And Although the travel for the volunteers or the interns has to be funded by the volunteer, however, the American Refugee Committee can provide a small living expense stipend and group housing if uh, they were inclined to get, um, you know, get experience working in a setting in a low resource setting. So that's one. If you, if you know, for a lot of people who just graduate, they're looking for um, getting more experience in terms of work. That's a great opportunity. Um, Another uh, another job uh, opportunity that I have is um, from um, this is uh, hold on um, so this is from the International Rescue Committee. They're looking for a technical advisor uh, for health programs for Francophone and other countries. And the basically the role of the technical advisor is to serve as the primary source of health uh, technical support for International Rescue Committee country programs and to interface between the staff and the designated countries. Um, they're looking for someone who has an MPH and uh, at least a year of field experience, uh, one year of uh, experience in the field. So that's something which would be there, and we will add it in our show notes, both uh, the links. So, yeah, those are the two jobs. Okay. So if you've just graduated and, and you're excited about getting in, into the uh, into getting a job in global health, uh, this is the place to come and find out more about that. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, thanks to the panel for participating. You guys rock. Don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. And until next week, uh, rock on. Bye. <laughs>